The long-haired yak has long black hair. He lets it grow. He doesn't care. He lets it grow and grow and grow. He lets it trail along the stair. Does he ever go to the barber shop? No. How wild and woolly and devil may care. A long-haired yak with long black hair would look when perched in a barber chair. <laughs> and then this is Polar Bear. The Polar Bear never makes his bed. He sleeps on a cake of ice instead. He has no blanket, no quilt, no sheet, except the rain and snow and sleep. He drifts about on a white ice floe while cold winds howl and blizzards blow and the temperature drops to 40 below. The polar bear never makes his bed. The blanket he pulls up over his head is lined with soft and feathery snow. If ever he rose and turned on the light, you would find a world of bathtub white and icebergs floating to the night.
I have just started to write them, and we had, uh, we're living in New York at the time, and uh, we just were gathered with a bunch of friends, and we thought that David had gone to bed. But he came and poked his head out from behind one of the chairs, and he said, it's laughing time, because we all were laughing about something or other. And I thought, well, it's a wonderful time. There should be a time to laugh and life. And so why not laugh? And so I wrote this little book, as it's called, now it's called Laughing Time, Collected Nonsense. And it's one that's been never out of print. And uh, I'm happy that uh, it's people like Becky who keeps it in print. And uh, it's still, uh, and I, I didn't even have a copy of it, so I'm sorry. I didn't bring one with me, but uh, uh, it is one of those things that still goes on. And this, I'm going to read it first, and then she will sing it, and then I have a little surprise for the rest of the, of the program. Laughing time. It was laughing time, and the tall giraffe lifted his head and began to laugh. Ha ha, ha ha. And the chimpanzee on the ginkgo tree swung merrily down with a tee hee 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 hee. It's certainly not against the law, croaked Justice Crow with a loud fault. Ha ha, ha ha. The dancing bear who'd never say no falls up and down on the tip of his toe. Ho ho, ho ho. The donkey daintily took his paw, and around they went, he haw, he haw, he haw, he haw. The moon had to smile as it started to climb. All over the world, it was laughing time. Ho, 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 he haw, he haw, he he, 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 ha, ha. They rose in curves, they rolled in hoops, 
than the chickens grew out of the chicken coops. The rooster crowed, the donkey brayed, and the cat the owl. She raised her hands. She lifted her feet. What was she playing? An anthem, a hymn? Nobody knew. But oh, it was sweet. How thin she was, how tall and grim. But oh, how she played. Everything in you went loose inside, and the world of a sudden became so wide and open and joyous and free. The fish came flying out of the sea, the mountains knelt, the birds went wild, the lady smiled. And all you could do was hold on to your hat, or hold on to your seat, and simply say, For heaven's sake, lady, play, play, for heaven's sake, lady, play. When the tall thing
about some letters uh, and put him up for an award. And I've been here in the for a year or so. And then suddenly this year, not only did he win, but he won it. And it's one of the major music awards. And uh, it was uh, with it a little of, of amount of $15,000, which is really, um, I feel is that uh, something that I've had something to do with. And I don't usually have anything to do with music. <laughs> but I decided, they said, they wrote to me from the Academy and said, since you nominated him, would you please write a citation? So they gave me some examples of citations, which usually were just about five lines. And all they said, you're limited to about 70 words. Well, I worked harder than I've worked on anything to get all this down on the paper in 70 words. And finally, I said, well, I, I wasn't at all. And I cut a, a couple of lines, which I afterwards I said, well, maybe it doesn't make that much difference. Why don't you add those lines too? Anyway, I'd like to read this poem, uh, which is a uh, caption for David, for Dan Cotton. Dan Tepper. Dan Tepper was born in Paris 32 years ago. His parents were Americans. They sent their gifted kid off to the local conservatoire. So the notes of music masters heard along the street became as familiar to him as pigeons at his feet. With schooling over, Dan one day set to music the poem about a piano playing lady. All this voted well and would soon explain what he'd be saying. A classic bit of Bach is taken by a playful jazz responder who for sure will find a wide, everyday acceptance that may very well endure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 the, the head of the music department, that in 26 years that she's been at the academy, that they never had a, a citation done in verse. <laughs> That's uh, nice to make a combination. And I, I'm, I'm used up so much of your time that I don't know whether it was time to go on with just a little bit, a page or two more. Of, you know, so maybe I could just speak about this with a gift of money, uh, which is not quite very long. Is that all right? So 
himself up to the Caribbean. The playwright talking to Dick Calvert, Calvert on PBS had remarked, Personally, I want to be buried in the sea. I want to be put in a sack and dropped overboard. This was with <coughs> which she expressed a blanch in a streetcar in Zara. I'll be buried at sea, up in a sack, sewn up in a sack, and dropped overboard at Newton and into the ocean, this blue and that first mother's eyes. As I stood there and remembered the hearing Tom laugh as he expressed himself several times in the 1930s, shortly after he discovered the word for hard frame, these lines of frame returned to me. Bind us in time of the seasons, trigger and all, and all, all minstrel gallions of carrot, carrot, fire. We, we bequeath us to no earthly show until it's answered in the vortex of our grave, the seal of wide spending days. I have heard that final <coughs> recited with great force and, and, and resonance by the drunken Dylan Thomas, one of Thomas' favorite poems, as well as by On the Edge of Oxford in 1947. Dylan's voice, unlike any other I have heard before or since, that ring in my ears. I suddenly realized why that voice was ringing so loud and clear. It was to remind me that I had witnessed the sea exactly the kind of burial that Tom Williams had pictured for himself. It was in July 1945, at the end of World War II in Europe, as the French frigate La Grande Vieille, on which in February 1944, I had embarked at Casablanca. Uh, as an American liaison officer. After a half a year of duty attached to the American South Pacific Fleet, the ship was returning to the French port of Brest and was planning to drop me off in Panama along with my liaison party of a radio man, a signal and a yeoman who had assisted me with communications, largely in the coding message. We were on the last Pacific leg of the journey, having left the islands of Nukuhiva and Hivaoa in the Marquesas Islands, which was still in the possession of the French, several nights before, when one night we had a murder on board. Le Corps, Robert, a young... Uh, Le Corps, sorry. Le Corps, the ship master carpenter, had been working on the gangplank when Robert Bobea, a young reservist in seaman, had become enraged because he thought that the carpenter, who was an expert and very much liked by everyone on board, had done a bad job. He followed the carpenter up on deck and knifed him in the back with a kitchen knife while the man was gazing out at sea. The next morning, the carpenter was dead, and the ship prepared for his burial at sea. At sunset the following evening, with the entire crew lined up on deck and the coast of Panama off in the distance, the body of the coal, sewn up in the canvas sack, was ready to be dropped into the deep. The scene took place a few days later, after the class menagerie with a rectangular in the main room open to break the clay on the road. And I made my 34-year old classmate rich and, rich and famous. <coughs> I had photographed the scene at the time, and the memory of it returned to me vividly with the sound of bugle taps and the firing of the rifles, saying farewell to a shipmate who would not be returning home to Brittany. I had just come to the conclusion of the scene when a touch of my elbow called me back to the candle through the mirror of the home. Dakin Williams, 
Thomas' younger brother, whom we had not seen for several years, greeted me, greeted me warmly. He explained to me that Tom's lawyers had thought that at first he should be burned, he should be buried in the pile next to his revered grandfather, but he had overruled them, and Tom was to be buried at the Paradise Cemetery in St. Louis, where he would rest next to his mother and near the great historical figure, figures of General Tecumseh Sherman and the explorers Lewis and Clark. I thank you all for coming this evening, and I'm sorry I went on so long uh, about reading.